The full moon in May brings a great drama. Two epic migrations, a great feast, an ancient mating ritual, fierce competition, struggles for survival, and dedicated people committed to saving it all. Best of all, it's true, and happens each spring on Delaware Bay. Every spring, seemingly out of nowhere, almost a million shorebirds appear on the shores of Delaware Bay. Most arrive around the second week of May and then vanish by early June, one brief month. But they're not here by accident. They're here because of another annual spring visitor, the American horseshoe crab that appears in huge numbers at the same time carpeting Delaware Bay beaches and surprising first-time human visitors as well. I got stationed here last year, last year March, yeah. and I came out here. This is the first beach I came to, and they were out here in May. I didn't know what they were. I was, I was kind of shocked. I was like, what, what are these things? Whether a first-time visitor or a local resident, it's easy to be overwhelmed by the sheer number of horseshoe crabs that suddenly appear on Bay beaches each spring. Relatively unchanged for over 450 million years, horseshoe crabs are one of nature's oldest creatures. They have outlived dinosaurs, survived ice ages, and even continent formations. To survive this long means they've adapted well, and one of their unique adaptations is to use warm beach sand to incubate their eggs. And since Delaware Bay is relatively shallow, with plenty of gently sloping sandy beaches, it's an ideal place for horseshoe crabs to gather, spawn, and deposit their eggs. Beginning in early May, prompted by longer days and warming waters, more than 20 million horseshoe crabs migrate into Delaware Bay and towards its sandy beaches. With each high tide, and especially with the new and full moon, the females come ashore, but not before waiting male crabs attach themselves in hopes of fertilizing their eggs. The larger females, dragging the smaller males behind them, use the high tide to help them crawl as far up the beach as possible to deposit their eggs. Since there are many more males than females, they compete to be in the best position to fertilize the eggs pushing and shoving each other on top of the females, even as the females maneuver to find an open area where they can dig. Once in position, the female burrows down into the sand and deposits a clutch of 2,000 to 4,000 grayish-green eggs, which are fertilized externally by the attached males. She molds the egg clutch with pebbles and coarse sand to ensure it will remain intact beneath the beach surface while the eggs incubate. During each tide cycle, a female may lay four or five egg clutches and then return to the bay as the high tide waters recede. She'll return with the next high tide, repeating this process until she has deposited as many as 100,000 eggs. If all goes well, the warm sand incubates the eggs and they hatch in about a month's time. The young larvae work their way up to the surface and are carried into the bay. In nine or 10 years, they mature and return to spawn and may live as long as 25 years. But for many eggs, things do not go well. Many clutches are disturbed, either by the bay's wave action or by successive spawning females who inadvertently dig up previously laid clutches. These come to the surface, are broken up, and soon millions of loose eggs are awash in the water and spread over the shoreline, just in time to provide thousands of arriving and hungry shorebirds with a critical feast on the beach. 
The shorebirds have come a long way for this annual banquet. Many have migrated from the tip of South America, where they've spent the Southern Hemisphere's summer feeding on small clams and mussels found in the vast mudflats there. But with winter arriving below the equator and spring warming the Northern Hemisphere, they're now headed north on an epic journey of 10,000 miles to the Arctic, where they will mate and lay their eggs. To reach Delaware Bay, some of these shorebirds have flown as many as 1,500 miles nonstop. It's a migration evolved over millennia. This feast is waiting for them, provided by millions of horseshoe crabs for this brief time. But now, another group of visitors arrives on Delaware Bay. An international team of researchers congregates every year along with the birds along the Delaware coastline, and everyone works together to recite as many birds as we can and capture birds and collect morphometric data. Officially known as the Delaware Shorebird Project, this team of international scientists, federal and state biologists, and dedicated volunteers has been studying this migration for two decades. So it needs to go down at the front a bit, quite a lot. Some critical data can only be gathered by catching the birds. So the team uses cannon nets, carefully placed along the shoreline where the shorebirds have been observed feeding. Yeah, I'm attaching the projectiles to the net so that once we fire the net, so once we fire the cannons, actually, this, these will pull out the net over the birds. This uh, cannon is loaded with a 16-gram charge of powder and a small electrostatic fuse. Once the cannon net has been set, the team must wait for the birds to return. The scientists plan each catch with the goal of capturing specific numbers and species of birds and vary the catch locations throughout the brief season. This means that the team often must wait for just the right mix of birds in the catch area. Are you ready? Fire. The captured birds are quickly covered to calm them and protect them from overheating. Although they are strong flyers, most shorebirds are quite fragile. To use less energy in flight, their bones are hollow. Researchers must carefully handle the birds while untangling them from the net and placing them in holding boxes. With all the birds collected and counted, the large catch team breaks into smaller groups, each focused on gathering data on a specific bird species. We've got a really nice catch again. Um, fewer knots than we would have really liked. We'd hope we caught more knots. We'd hope to get over 30 knots. We've probably only got 20. Red knots are about the size of a robin with a similar red breast, which is their mating plumage. Like the other shorebirds, they've traveled thousands of miles nonstop and often arrive just feathers and bone. Once here, they must feed voraciously on the fat, rich horseshoe crab eggs to quickly gain enough weight so they can continue migrating north. And while the team monitors multiple bird species, it's the red knot they study most closely. The red knot is the one that we focus on most. And there's two reasons for that. The first is it has the longest migration route so that therefore it needs to have everything in place all the way up its migration route. And the second thing, being the largest of this group of shorebirds and feeding on very small eggs, it is the one that it is most susceptible if the number of eggs declines. They need many times more eggs uh, than a semi-palmated sandpiper does to get to the Arctic uh, because they weigh five times as much as a semi-palmated sandpiper. Semi-palmated sandpipers are the smallest shorebird the team monitors and another of these long distance migrants. Often called peeps, they have buffy white breasts and can usually be found feeding right at the water's edge. Sanderlings are also studied. They are another sandpiper species, but about twice the size of a semi and have a reddish tinge to their feathers. Finally, there are the ruddy turnstones, 
the feistiest shorebird, with a masked face and one of the only shorebirds that can actually dig for eggs. Many other bird species appear on the bay beaches as well, from the fairly common dunlin to the exotic-looking black-necked stilt. But all are here for a common purpose, to feast on the abundance provided by the horseshoe crabs. While their eggs are vital for the shorebirds' continued existence, the crab's blue blood is equally important for human survival. Horseshoe crab blood is one million times more sensitive to harmful bacteria than our own and can detect even the smallest deadly pathogen. For this reason, biomedical firms collect a portion of blood from selected crabs, extract the white blood cells, and process them to produce the medical testing powder known as LAL. LAL is now used worldwide to test the sterility of every needle, artificial limb, and injected drug before humans can safely use them. But people have long relied on horseshoe crabs for other purposes as well. In the 19th century, they were harvested by the millions for use as fertilizer. But that changed by the 1950s, when the use of cheap chemical fertilizers made their harvest unnecessary and their harvest numbers dropped dramatically. Then in the late 1980s, serious harvesting began again when commercial fishermen discovered they were the ideal bait to catch eel and conch. This renewed crab harvest for bait coincided with growing research efforts aimed at better understanding why huge numbers of shorebirds congregated on Delaware Bay beaches each spring and the ecological relationship between the crabs and birds. With the crab harvest unregulated and intensifying, Delaware Bay quickly became the center of a controversy involving commercial fishermen and environmental groups. During the 90s, harvest pressure threatened the egg food source of the migrating shorebirds, and their numbers declined. Fortunately, harvest limits were gradually implemented and the crab harvest is now managed for the benefit of both the fishermen and the birds. The system is much more secure and much more robust than it was when I started working. And also there is a much greater understanding of the importance of all parts of the system for it to be a healthy ecosystem. And that's much better than it was 20 years ago when people hadn't realized how everything fits together. To better understand how everything fits together means that data on both the crab and bird populations must be gathered every year. Each of the four species the shorebird team studies are processed in a similar manner once a catch has been made and the processing groups assembled. Some of these birds have only just arrived, so it'll be really interesting to see what, what they weigh now, because they'll be coming in quite light, around 100 grams. And in the next couple of weeks, they're going to put on another 100 grams. Double their weight in two weeks. Amazing things. Processing begins with each bird receiving a numbered metal band on one leg. The condition of the feathers is noted, and the head, beak, and wings of each bird are measured and recorded. 65.0 and 34.7. However, it's the weight that is perhaps the most important indicator of each bird's overall health. During their recent non-stop flight from South America, many birds have lost as much as half of their body weight. 111.5. In two weeks of frenzied feeding, red knots will put on 80 to 100 grams, gaining weight at a remarkable rate of 4 to 9 percent a day, an adaptation unique in the animal world. To gain weight this quickly, these birds expand their digestive organs upon arriving on Delaware Bay. Two weeks later, and closer to 200 grams, they shrink them in preparation for their next long flight to the Arctic, where there may still be snow and no food. 
For 20 years now, scientists have been studying red knots and the other shorebirds that make this migratory journey. As their understanding of these species has grown, they've refined their research practices to gather more detailed data about the overall populations and even individual birds. This includes the way in which the birds are now banded or flagged. In the past, shorebirds were banded with colored rings on their legs, indicating the year and location they were caught on their migration route. However, there was nothing on the rings to identify individual animals, which limited how well that animal's migration could be monitored. What we're doing now is putting individual flags on the birds that we've caught so that we can recognize them in the field. So each knot and turnstone and sandaling will have a little lime green flag with an inscription on which will have three characters on it, and that will identify that bird as an individual. Now, using alphanumeric codes for each bird, scientists are able to monitor each animal for the rest of its life and use that data to help estimate overall species population size. Researchers also take a small feather sample of every red knot to determine where that animal was before arriving on Delaware Bay. When the birds are changing their feathers in wintertime, they eat the food that is in the area around them. That has its own specific isotope signature and that is carried through the nutrients into the growing feathers, where it is fixed forever in those feathers. Uh, and those stable isotopes vary between sites, so we can easily tell if a bird is wintering in the Caribbean or wintering in southern tip of South America. Back at the team's field station, the collected feather is carefully cleaned and finely chopped. An extremely small sample is weighed and packaged for later lab analysis. For birds that migrate across half the planet, this is an extremely accurate research tool for determining a shorebird's wintering site. Cannon netting and feather sampling helps determine when distinct flocks arrive on bay beaches, but monitoring their movements and counting their numbers throughout their brief stay requires a rigorous daily reciting effort. So when we go out to look for these birds with flags on them, we'll take our spotting scope and our binoculars, and most importantly, our field notebook. And we'll go to uh, our assigned beach. We try to cover all of the beaches. We're looking for red knots, ruddy turnstones, sanderlings, and then we'll just search through the flocks of birds looking for a bird with a flag. When we see a flag, we need to read the, the code that's on the flag. It's typically two or three letters or numbers, and then we'll record that information on our field notebook. There are multiple reciting teams sent out each day, each gathering valuable data. So it's important that all team field notes are processed promptly. While we're all here and all together, um, all the data gets entered, we then check it and make any corrections. So by the time the field season's over, all the data is prim and proper and uh, ready for analysis. Sending multiple teams out daily to recite birds for an entire month while also conducting periodic catches is not only labor intensive, but requires a large team. It's a huge volunteer effort and we depend completely on our volunteers to run the project. Um, we have a whole range of volunteers. We have some people who have been coming since the start of the project, so for about 20 years. And we have a lot of people who just came this year. Some people invest a small amount of time, just three days. Sometimes we have volunteers. Um, we had a couple young people this year who came and are staying for the entire month. And while there are many volunteers monitoring the shorebirds, there are many others equally committed to monitoring the spawning horseshoe crabs, which is done periodically throughout May and June. Spawning female crabs rely on the high tide to spawn as far up on the beach as possible. So the largest number of animals appears with the highest tides, which occurs in the evenings around the new and full moon. So with each lunar event, volunteers on 17 bay beaches spend three nights surveying the spawning horseshoe crab population. Since there are thousands of animals, it's impossible to count them all. 
So the survey teams take 100 samples on each beach, counting the number of females and males within each sample grid. Each year we get numerous volunteers, citizen scientists to come out, help us conduct these surveys. And the great thing is the data that are generated in this survey and other similar surveys is used to manage the horseshoe crab resource. Another way horseshoe crabs are being monitored is with tagging. Biologists and volunteers have been doing this as part of a coast-wide U.S. fish and wildlife study since 2003. Despite their slow movements, horseshoe crabs can travel great distances over time. If a citizen scientist or a beachcomber finds a tagged crab later on another beach, they can call in the crab's unique number, learn where it was first caught and tagged, and help fisheries managers better understand the movements of the overall horseshoe crab population. For over 20 years, dedicated scientists and volunteers have been gathering data about these very different species as they congregate in this world-class spectacle each spring. Their efforts to maintain and protect this remarkable natural phenomenon are beginning to show results. But because the birds and crabs can each live 20 or more years, it requires a long-term monitoring effort, which is often a challenge to maintain. People are often interested in when there's a problem, but they're not that keen generally on getting the data beforehand. So monitoring is incredibly important to provide good scientific data to base conservation action on because there's no point in taking action unless it's going to work. So you have to have the scientific data before that. 52.5. Fortunately, there are now two decades of good data on the birds and crabs. Using these rich data sets, federal fisheries managers have developed a statistical computer model that can predict an allowable horseshoe crab harvest for the benefit of both the birds and the commercial fishermen. When we have the monitoring data, when we have an estimate of the horseshoe crab population, an estimate of the red knot population, it honestly takes a matter of minutes because all we have to do is take this giant optimized output file and just search the columns and say, what row gives us this population size for horseshoe crabs, this population size for red knots, and therefore, what is the harvest action that, that we should take given those two bits of information? This adaptive management practice means that the Delaware Bay crab resource is being managed for these long distant migrants, providing them with the food required to reach their next critical destination, the Arctic, where they must mate, nest, and lay their eggs. But with the growing effects of climate change, the birds are now challenged there as well. They need to lay their eggs as soon as the snow melts so that the chicks hatch when the peak insect abundance is occurring. The chicks, as they hatch out, start to feed. And the abundant insects means they can do that. And that, this is the important thing linking with climate change as well, because if there's a mismatch of the timing, then they're not going to be able to breed. The timing of snow melt is becoming more variable. So global warming is giving us a more variable environment which the birds are having real difficulty in adapting to. Despite challenges emerging elsewhere on their migration route, the managed crab harvest means that shorebirds will continue to stop on Delaware Bay, provided there are spawning horseshoe crabs. However, a new threat, sea level rise, now threatens some of the bay's best spawning habitat. For this reason, the state of Delaware, with federal assistance, recently added protection to the crab spawning beaches within the Mispillion Harbor Reserve and replenished them to meet the needs of spawning crabs and shorebird flocks. This year it's been great for the birds because whatever the wind direction, the crabs can spawn in there, so there are always eggs for the birds. Thanks to the efforts of government agencies, nonprofits, dedicated scientists and volunteers, this meeting of migrations will continue to happen each May and amaze all who choose to come and experience it.
it's absolutely world class. It's op- it's absolutely unique in the world, and I think people should, when they can in, a, in an appropriate manner without disturbing the birds, come and take advantage of that and see it. Fortunately, the Mispillion Harbor Reserve, where much of the shorebird research takes place, is also the home of the DuPont Nature Center. Established by the state in 2007, the center's displays explain this amazing phenomenon to an increasing number of visitors each year. You've got the nature center there with lots of information and the amazing camera. So you can actually go and have a look really close at the birds on the beaches in Miss Pillion and you can control the camera yourself so that you can move around, have a look at, look at individual birds, look at the different species and even read the leg flags that we've put on them. And the, birds. the center is also a convenient place where researchers can share their knowledge and where the public can easily view this world-class spectacle. But while shorebirds keep their distance, horseshoe crabs predictably appear with every high tide and invite direct human engagement. With the growing awareness of their value, local communities and residents have found unique ways to enjoy, respect, and protect them. Ten Delaware Bayshore communities have partnered with the nonprofit group ERDG to conserve horseshoe crabs through ERDG's Backyard Stewardship Program. Communities establish crab sanctuaries and promote the Just Flip 'em initiative with the goal of helping stranded crabs. It used to be years ago, you'd walk the beach and you'd see a footprint in the sand and you'd see a crab you know, overturned. And now, since we became the Horseshoe Crab Sanctuary, we ended up having a lot more people that are actually now getting out and flipping horseshoe crabs. They, they you go your morning walk and what do you do? You flip crabs. The crab spawning also serves as a teaching opportunity for educators. While it's nice to study animal migration using African wildebeest herds, there's nothing like having students experience this learning firsthand through a field trip encounter with a similar world-class migration. The same principles operate in all ecosystems, but this is one that's accessible, it's easy for them to see and understand. They get away from what their, is their normal home life and they come in and they check out something that's a little different, maybe a little creepy, that kind of makes it a little more interesting. But it's exactly the same principles, just different organisms. And for still others, the crabs, like all living things, are to be honored through prayer and ceremony. Buddhism uh, is just a no kill. And then for a lot of living things, okay, like this horseshoe crab, okay, so they they try to survive. But for whatever reason, when when the wave come over, they flip over. So we just try to help them, just give them a push, and then they're free. A month later, and another full moon. The shorebirds are gone, and now in the barren Arctic. Most have already mated, nested, and hatched their chicks, hopefully timed perfectly so that the young birds can feed on the millions of insects that hatch at the same time. Soon the adult birds will begin their long journey south, leaving their young to follow later on their own. For some, a journey of nearly 10,000 miles. Meanwhile, in Delaware, the shorebird project team has departed as well, leaving local biologists to process this year's data and time to reflect on the project's achievements, due in large part to volunteer participation. I think this is one of the best volunteer citizen scientist projects I've ever seen, but for a couple reasons. One is that they're out on the beach where they're seeing birds that they know are really important and are somewhat accessible, and they can see the horseshoe crabs really easily. But also because we can bring people who don't know a lot about how to handle birds and integrate them into the team because of the way we've set this up. On the same full moon, other volunteers survey the horseshoe crabs one last time before they depart 
and return to the ocean. By the end of June, the bay beaches have regained their solitude, making it hard to believe this great drama has ever taken place, challenging all those who'd like more people to see and experience it. This phenomenon is worth everyone's attention. We have people in close proximity to this resource that have little idea that this is occurring basically right outside their doorstep. And it is a spectacle that you must see to appreciate. Whether practicing community conservation, collecting scientific data, or simply experiencing it for the first time, this annual meeting of migrations once again proves nature's ability to amaze us and inspire us to value and protect our natural world.